And if you'd like to be turning your Bibles up to uh, open to Exodus 17, Exodus 17 will be our lesson text this morning, kind of an interesting chapter that is kind of multifold, uh, starts out bad but gets better, certainly is good to see everyone. I'm always amazed by the time I sit down, about two or three minutes till, the number of people that come in. <laughs> I, th- I thought, well, we got a lot of people out of town today, but it looks like we've got a good crowd this morning. We're certainly glad to see you. Good to see Jimmy Thomas with us this morning. Uh, you wouldn't believe all the things Jimmy's had to go through to be here. It's good to see him. Notice uh, he's got a lot of accoutrements with him. He's been sick and had uh, all kinds of things for a while. And boy, it's just good, good, good to see him. Sorry to hear about uh, Helen Stewart. Va- uh, Vacation Bible School, those of you that helped with that, oh, boy, I tell you what, thank you. I can't remember ever having more fun or, or uh, seeing more people or seeing more interest than we had this year. It was just a great, uh, great week, great theme like to tell Andy uh, thank you, but I tell you, uh, he works so hard. I said, listen, Andy, I just want you and Amy to take the week off. You know, next week, just take the week off. I want you to go somewhere. And so, uh, no, they actually had a vacation already planned. But So they're enjoying that, but we're certainly glad. But I don't know about you, but those of you who are here, have you, have you, go, have you been going through the rest of the week and have this tremendous urge when you're walking around to go, I'm a little bitty frog and God loves me. Have you, have you wanted to do that? I found myself walking around, you know one of our vacation Bible school songs. But in the <clears throat> book of Exodus, chapter 17, we're going to use this story to kind of kick off what we're going to talk about this week and next week. That's uh, so what, first of all, this week we're going to talk about the things that we gain from one another. How that our being here, how our being in fellowship with one another, what the church does, what we gain from one another. And then next week, we're going to talk about what we say, what we say by our attendance when we come on uh, the various times the church comes together, what we say through our attendance. But notice in Exodus 17, it doesn't start off. It's not a very good chapter to begin with because we have Israel doing like Israel does so often, and that is they're murmuring. They're upset because they don't have water. And maybe some of you thought when we first went to Exodus 17, this was going to be the story of Moses uh, because here Moses is told to strike the rock. He is told to strike the rock and that the water will flow from it. You'll remember later on, Moses is told not to strike the rock, but to speak to the rock. And, of course, he kind of messes that up, and it costs him his opportunity to go into the promised land. But here we find uh, he uh, names this place in verse 7. He calls the name of it Massa and Meribah, this location that they're at, because the children of Israel had strove with God and had said, Is the Lord among us? Or not. Now it's amazing when you think of all the things that they had been through. They had seen the ten plagues that had uh, been brought upon Egypt. They had watched the death of the firstborn, including the, the Pharaoh's son. And here they get out and get in a little bit of a pinch out in the wilderness and start saying, Well, is God among us? So that had to be pretty disheartening for Moses. But then they don't have a lot of time to dwell about that or think on that because a nation, a group of people called Amalek, Amalek, comes and attacks Israel. So they're immediately thrown into a battle situation. Notice in verse 8, Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose out men and go fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in mine hand. So Joshua did as Moses said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses and Aaron and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. But when he let down his hand... Amalek prevailed, but Moses' hands were weary. Now, I don't know about you, but if you've ever tried to hold something in a position out from you, I remember in basic training, they made us hold our M16s out in front of us. If I had to throw that bad boy up there, and I was going like, boy, this ain't nothing. Hee, I got this whoop. Well, about three minutes later, uh, everything that you ever thought is starting to scream in your shoulders and stuff just because you're holding this little bitty thing that doesn't weigh that much. But after a while, it starts weighing a lot. And you can imagine how Moses would have grown tired how his shoulders would have become weary. It says his hands were heavy, and they took a stone and put it under him. And he sat thereon, and Aaron and Hur stayed, on the, uh, stayed up his hands, the one on the one side, the other on the other side, and his hands were steady until the going down of, sun and, of the sun. And jo- Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. And so here we see how this wouldn't have turned out probably as well as it did had it not been for a couple of people that were with Moses. That, of course, being the high priest Aaron and her, who were able to help him hold up his hands. And brethren, you know, sometimes uh, we, we think maybe we don't need help. 
that we're so strong or we're so talented or we're so this or that that we can get through this life without one another. Well, the Bible doesn't tell us that. If we believe God and we believe the scriptures, then we need to understand the Bible tells us we need each other. We need each other. We're going to look at four points this morning from what we gain from one another. What we gain from one another. One another. Number one, we gain strength to carry our common mission. Number two, we gain comfort and we gain encouragement to help us endure our trials. Number three, we gain wisdom to grow in God's word. And last but not least, we gain examples to help us and guide us in our lives. We gain examples. Number one, first of all, before we even establish any of that, we need one another. God does nothing capriciously. He does, he's not fickle. He just doesn't say, hey, I think I'll do this and maybe do that. Everything that God does is for a reason. And when we look back at men like the Apostle Paul and read where they wrote, for God is my record, Paul, writing to the church at Philippi, his most uh, I book, if you will, I, 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 over 65 times in this book, he'll talk about himself, very personal, that he loved this congregation, and he's writing to them, says, this is my record, how greatly I long after you in the bowels of Jesus Christ. The word bowels there, you can place that with the word heart or my thoughts or my deepest, most intellect, Paul says, I miss you, and I'd, I'd give anything to be able to be with you. Of course, his work had carried him to other places. There were other churches that needed, to, needed his help. But Paul says, I long for you. I miss you. And then we find in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 11, probably the first book penned, maybe even in the New Testament, but certainly by the Apostle Paul. He says, Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also you do. Two, uh, particularly one of my favorite words in all of the Greek New Testament or in this, in this passage, this word comfort, wherefore comfort, comes from the root word of parakaleo, and it means to call to the side, to, admon to admonish, to, to encourage, to uh, try to uplift. It literally is, is the idea of, of putting your arm around somebody and walking with them and trying to get them to feel better about a situation, to try to give them the strength to do better in whatever it is you're trying to encourage them in. It is a heartfelt calling to the side, calling and encouraging. But this next word is, is really interesting, the word edify. It comes from a compound Greek word, oikos, which is a house, and domio, which means to build. And it literally means to build a house, a house builder. And what he's talking now about there is to build you up. One of the interesting things I thought I'd just spend just a quick a moment with this morning is notice how the King James here translates that word, oikodemo. And they translate it to edify, to build up, because that's what he's talking about there. The King James Version is about as a literal translation as you'll find. But just to show you how even more literal the American Standard Version is, notice how they translate this passage. It says, wherefore, exhort one another and build each other up. They really want you to see that emphasize of building the house. So they actually translate it, build, and, and that's the meaning as well. But the, the word, the idea there is to edify, to build up, to encourage each other. Call along the side and build each other up. The church at Thessalonica is encouraged to build each other up and to encourage each other. It's one of the reasons that, uh, of course, we even assemble. We gain strength, number one, to carry on the mission. We have to remember that we're in the army. If you obey the gospel, you may not realize it, but you enlisted into the army of God. And the army of God, I like the army's motto nowadays. Uh, you know, back when I was in, it was be all you can be, and then there was the army of one. But nowadays, I see a lot of army signs, and on the army signs, it has the idea of boots on the ground. And, of course, the idea there is you, with the Air Force and with drones and things like that, you can run around and you can blow stuff up. You know, you can wreak a whole lot of havoc. But if you want to actually talk to people and get in people's minds and try to help them and, and actually encourage them, on the, you're going to have to be on the ground. And that's the idea of the army today is boots on the ground. Well, brethren, we're the boots on the ground, if you will. If the pillar and the ground of the truth is going to have the effect that it's supposed to, and by the way, the pillar and ground of the truth is the church, then we're going to have to have our boots on the ground. We're the ones that are going to do the legwork. That's not the angels of heaven. They have not been called to preach the gospel of Christ. The Lord is not going to preach the gospel of Christ. He has enlisted me and you to be the preachers to be the teachers, to put the boots on the ground, if you will. We're not issued a physical 
military weapons. That's not the kind of war that we're fighting. But Paul and one of his great metaphors, Paul loved metaphors. Metaphors teach a whole lot of lessons without ever having to say a whole lot. You can take the illustration of the soldier that Paul, by the way, is, is chained to uh, as he's penning the Ephesian letter, and you can see the metaphor, and you can, you can, you can ex explore that like nothing else. As a matter of fact, I can't tell you, brethren, how many times I have went over the armor of God and how many times I have read, I have read entire books on the armor of God. But it is amazing to me. I'm sitting at home this morning going over my lesson, and lo and behold, there's something there that I'd never seen before, and I'll share that with you here in just a moment. But notice in Ephesians chapter 6, he talks about having our loins girt with the truth. Well, the truth is that which holds everything up, just like a... Back when I was in, they called it load-bearing equipment. It was this belt you wore and you had your canteen, magazines, first aid pouch, entrenching tool, bayonet, anything else you could stick on that thing. You'd carry that. Well, that's the idea. The Roman soldier would carry his sword in there plus anything that he needed. It's the thing that carried things, and that's the idea here. Loins girt with the truth. You have to have the truth. The breastplate of righteousness. You've got to live the right life, and it also protects those vital organs, protects your heart. Uh, then the feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Now the Romans didn't, this is more or less a Greek soldier that we see right here. He wears these things, I can't remember the, the actual name of them, but they're kind of like leg guards that you'd see a, an umpire wear or a hind catcher wear. Well, the Romans didn't wear those. They wore uh, sandals, but these sandals were tied up around the instep and the back of the heel real well, but one of the things that I wasn't aware of, the very word itself implied the idea of having these little metal things that stick out of the bottom. Sure enough, I do a Google search, and there's a lot of people that spend a lot of time, you know, reenacting, and they want to have everything looks just like it did back in the day, and here's some of these Roman sandals that actually have these little metal spikes, kind of like cleats, if you will, and it had uh, the idea, this cleat on this sandal had this particular Greek name that had the idea of preparation. And the foot soldier wore these. Officers didn't wear them, and so they would just kind of stick out. You could hear them better when they'd march across that, uh, those Roman roads as well. But she, feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. You've got to have your boots on. You've got to be ready to go. You've got to be prepared. I know one of the things that, you know, we, one of the, the deals in the military, you do it uh, anywhere you go. You're going to have inspections to make sure that you have all the things that you need. You have to be prepared. You have to have the equipment. And that's what's stressed here with the feet shod, with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the fiery, the, the shield of faith so that you can quench those fiery darts of the devil. The helmet of salvation, of course, which protects the head. And then last but not least, of course, the sword of the spirit, which we know to be the word of God. We are in a war. We're in a battle. And we need this armor if we're going to defeat Satan and his foes. And, of course, we're not talking about a physical confrontation. We're talking about a war that takes place in principalities and powers and heavenly places. Our battles are spiritual. They are battles for the hearts and minds of men, not to be able to subdue them uh, physically. An army's morale is important. One of the things over and over again, one of the things the apostles wrote, one of the things Peter says, I bring you in remembrance, I'm trying to encourage you. The book of Revelations is written as, a, as, a, as an encouragement. Listen, you can overcome. Things are bad now, we're going through struggles, but you can overcome. That's why Revelation was penned. Tonight we will study the book of Daniel, we'll begin a, a lengthy study in the book of Daniel. And one of the things that we'll see is that Daniel's written for the same reason. The people of God are in a bad way. And the book of Daniel is written to show that God is in charge. And it's going to be okay. He's going, not going to forget his faithful remnant. And so an army's morale, be it the old covenant or the new covenant, is very important. But yet, then you have brethren, you have soldiers in the army that want to go out and complain about everything. We had that in the real army, you know. I don't like the uniforms. I don't like the generals. Boy, if I was one of the generals, here's what I'd do, and things would be so much better. You know... We used to have a saying that if a soldier wasn't griping, he wasn't happy, you know. So uh, that, that's, that, that happens a lot in the Army. But in the Lord's Army, we don't need that kind of business. Brethren, I'm convinced sometimes that if some of my brethren had been there with Moses, they'd have been tickling him under his arms to get him to put him down, you know, fighting everything they could to work for the other fella. Here you can see a cartoon. Come on, Moses, we want the home team to win or Amalek. 
And I'm afraid sometimes brethren are like that. Instead of holding your arms up, they want to pull your arms down. We even know in the time of the Apostle Paul, things were going on just like that. Men who were trying to lead people after themselves and hurt the cause of God. The Bible teaches that we're to be unified, that we're to be a one. Notice uh, it demands communion. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 33, after Paul has just really gotten after the Corinthians for making the Lord's Supper into some common meal where some rich folks were eating until they just about to bust and the poor people had nothing to eat and some of them were going ahead and eating and not waiting for the others, he tells them, he sums that up in verse 30, 33 and says, you tarry for one another. You wait on one another. Why? Because you need to all be there. You need to all be there and you need to have communion, common, koine. That's something you all do together. Nobody does better than the next fella, but you do it together. You wait for each other. As a matter of fact, not only does the Bible demand communion, but it is quick to condemn division. The whole book starts out with the fact that you had some says, I'm a Cephas, that'd be Peter. Some say I'm of Paul, some say I'm of Apollos, others say I'm of Christ. Four different factions at least. Then Paul starts making the arguments, was I crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? And he'll condemn the very division and beseech them in verse 10 that they speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among them. Brethren, that's why it's so important that we have this oneness mindset. The Bible teaches it. John 17, 20 and 21, Jesus prays that they might be one and that the world, notice the end of verse 21, may believe that thou hast sent me. How are they going to believe that, Jesus? Because of the oneness of those that come after. And we can see today that that's anything but the case. And brethren, that's a, a noble thing to try to have oneness, and we should. But notice that oneness is based on something. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6 says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you, Paul, beseeching the Ephesian brethren, that you walk worthy of the vocation or the job wherein you've been called. You see, we've got a work to do. We've got a job. We've got responsibilities. And Paul says, walk worthy of it. Walk worthy of it with all lowliness and meekness, with long-suffering, forbearing one another in love. There's the key. And he goes on and says, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body. There is one Spirit, even as you're called in one hope of your calling. You see, to tell someone there is one body or that there is one church, it's no different than saying there's one spirit or there is one calling or that there is one Lord or one faith or one baptism. And we're doing this to promote unity, not encourage division. But it is wrong to say that, well, I know that there are many churches out here now, so we'll just not say anything about that and we'll just play like that's cool so that we can be unified. Folks, that's, that's not... That's not the unity that the Bible talks about. In order for us to be unity, to have unity, to be unified, we have to preach the same thing. That's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1.10, I beseech you that you all speak the same thing. And could we not all speak the same thing if we took the words of Peter? In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 11, it says, If any man speak, how's he supposed to speak? As the words of God, as the oracles of God. And if a man stands in a pulpit and preaches the word of God and speaks the word of God, then we can be unified. But when one fellow reads one, one body and tries to tell you, now listen here, don't worry about that. I know the one body and the one church are the same, but there's really a lot of churches. Or they read the one baptism and say, I know that's what that says, but there's a bunch of them today. You know that he's left the authority of God. You can't have union with that. You can't have unity with that. Verse 6, one God, and Father of all, who is above all and through you all and in you all. Hebrews 10, 23, one of the reasons that we come together is to promote this unity, brethren, to have this oneness, to have this encouragement. Notice verse 23. Now, most of us probably know verse 25, not forsaking the assemblies of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but notice the context of that. Verse 23 says, let us hold fast the profession of our faith. Same idea as vocation, our job, our responsibility. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. For he is faithful that promised. Then he says in verse 24, Let us consider, there's our word again, one another to provoke and to love and to good works. You're to provoke me, I'm to provoke you. And we do this how? In the assembling of ourselves together. And that's why the Apostle Paul or the Hebrew writer, whoever that is, 
It says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. Brethren, there is no way in this world that you can exhort me if I never see you. There's no way that you can encourage me and uplift me and hold up my hands if I don't know where you are. That's an impossibility. It just can't be done. In order to encourage me, in order to lift up my hands and I yours, we're going to have to see one another. And one of the great opportunities that we have is when we assemble ourselves together. Yeah, there's no doubt in my mind the number that we have here will be reduced by at least 25% by tonight. That is just the nature of things. That's the way it seems to go nowadays. Should that be the case? Well, I know that many of us will, some of us will be providentially hindered. But how many of us will just sit at home because, hey, I'm tired. It's Sunday. This is my off day. You know, I don't need to study the Bible no more. Obviously, I have, uh, you know, every, everything I need to know. Well, that's one of the things we're going to look at here tonight is the fact or today is the fact that we do learn when we come together. Not forsaking the assembly. Have that kind of unity. Number two, we get comfort and encouragement from one another when we assemble. We gain this that helps us to endure trials. Notice in Philippians chapter 4, again, a very personal book of Paul. He says, Now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me. That's the word fellowship, by the way. And he's not talking about the right hand of fellowship there. He's talking about money. No man, nobody communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. But that's the same word that's used for fellowship, uh, koine, in our, uh, in, in our Bibles. No church communicated, no church fellowship with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. You would do that passage no disservice if you translated it just like that. It's the same word. He says, you helped me out. You were with me. And don't you know that was an encouragement to Paul? Do you think he found that support that he was getting from the Philippians church to be a discouragement? Absolutely not. He found it to be a great encouragement. We got a new uh, newsletter uh, from uh, Daniel. You know, every month he's putting out a newsletter about his uh, uh, raising money to go to Africa. There's a really heartwarming story on there. I encourage you to read that. If you don't have time to read it back there in the back, write down that web address, go to it later, and, and read just very uplifting about brethren that are coming together and trying to work hard to communicate with him as he endeavors to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Notice verse 16. It says, for even, uh, for even in Thessalonica ye sent once and again unto my necessity, not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that I may abound to your account. He says, but I have all and abound. I am full and have received of Ephroditus the things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. He describes their monetary gift as what would take place in the old covenant when they would burn incense, frankincense, myrrh, things of that nature. They'd burn that uh, in the temple. And he says it's a sweet smelling. It's a sacrifice. It's what it is. And he compares that with that. Now, do you think Paul was encouraged by that? You better believe he was. Those brethren were encouraging him. And how many times do we think that our giving could be an encouragement to other folks? And in reality, it, it very much is you know that it was a, a, a great encouragement to Paul. We have a support group, brethren, as members of the Lord's church, second to none. In Mark 10, 29, Peter just asked Jesus, well, what's in it for us, Lord? Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you, there is no man that hath left house or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake in the gospels, notice, but he shall receive a hundredfold now in this time, now. Houses, brethren, sisters, mothers, and children, and lands with persecutions, and in the world to come, eternal life. Jesus says, you'll be blessed in this world. From following me, you will have mothers, you will have brothers, you will have sisters, you will have a family that you never even thought about. Some of us may be only children, many, some of us may have two or three siblings, but it's nothing like you have in the body of Christ. And not only in this body of Christ, but when we go and visit another body of Christ, guess what? It's your extended family. Kind of like going to see your cousins. And then you go someplace else, you may have family other countries that you don't even know about, you've never even met, but they're your family. And they're the children of God. And they'll love you and they'll support you. And the Lord says, notice that comes with persecutions as well. Not shouldn't be from your brethren, but from the world. James 5.16 Talking to Christian, James says, confess your faults one to another. That's something that brethren ought to be able to do and pray for one another that you may be healed. 
The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Notice we can talk about our problems in a way that no one else can, at least we should, and we should be able to find strength from our brethren along those lines. We have no choice in the physical families that we're born into, but this family, brethren, you've got a choice. You don't have to obey the gospel. You don't have to become a member of the Lord's church, but if you do, it'll be because you have chosen it, and you have chosen to be a part of the family of God. Number three, we gain wisdom to grow in the word. We gain wisdom in Bible classes. I can't believe I've ever said in a Bible class that I haven't at least picked up on something. See things from another's perspective, that's always good. Warned by friends that love us. Warned by friends that love us. Now, sometimes that might not feel too good. Sometimes it might not feel real well when you know the preacher is talking about you. You know it's on you because you, your, your conscience is bothering you. Your toes are hurting because he's stepping all over them. And you're saying, he wrote this lesson for me. And what you don't realize is many times he's actually preaching unto himself. It just happens to be landing on you. That's the way the gospel works. I'd say, dare say, many of us haven't sat in too many Bible classes where we haven't found that the speaker, that the person doing the teaching, was stepping all over us. Sometimes it hurts. Acts 20 at verse 32, talking about the Bible, talking about the Word of God, Paul says, And now, brethren, I commend you to God and the Word of His grace, which is able to build you up and to give you inheritance among them which are sanctified. That's what the Bible does for us. That's why we need to study. It's able to build us up. It's able to encourage us and give us an inheritance. 1 Peter 2, 2 would talk about as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the Word. As little children cry and scream after wanting that bottle, we ought to have that desire for the Word of God, not only for ourselves, but to be able to teach others, be able to teach our children and our families that they may grow thereby. Proverbs 27, 6 says, Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Think about that for a moment. Faithful are the words of a friend. But the kisses of an enemy, they're deceitful. You're doing that which is wrong, you have a whole bunch of people in the world telling you, ah, oh, don't worry about it, man, that's the way things are. They may even give you a kiss, buy you another one, pat you on the back and tell you about how all the things you have in common. But faithful are the wounds of a friend who tells you you ought not be doing that. You know that's against, that's not how God would have you to live your life. You know that's wrong. You shouldn't do that. Now that may hurt. But the Bible tells us that faithful are the wounds of a friend. What's he saying that for? Because he loves you. He's concerned about you. He wants to see you go to heaven. You see, as Christians, our main thing is to see each other have that eternal life that we all hold so dear and, and are desiring so much to have. And when we see a brother that's walking out of step or walking disorderly, the most loving thing that we can do is encourage them to walk right. I think uh, so many times I can't help but think of Brother Warren when it comes to uh, things like that and so many that uh, for so many years he was so patient with. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. It might not feel too good when it's taking place, but it helps us. It'll make us stronger if we listen. Galatians 6, 2 says, Bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. We can learn and we can grow thereby. Not only that, but when, brethren, what we gain from one another, we gain examples to help guide us. Of course, Christ is the perfect example, but others have also been godly examples in the New Testament. 1 Peter 2, verse 21 talks about the Christ, that he left us an example. Notice, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. By, I mean, no doubt about it, Jesus is our number one example. That's how we ought to live our lives as best we can. But there were other New Testament characters that are spoken of that, that we could use as examples too. Remember Paul, 1 Corinthians 11, 1, Be ye followers of me, as I also am of Christ. Now Paul would be the first to tell you, if he quit following Christ, don't follow him. But he says, I'm an example that you can follow. He told Timothy, let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers. Be an example. Live your life as an example. Brethren, I, I can think back in my life, and I remember that there were times that I did things that I might not want wanted to do. I might have wanted to do other things, but I did what was right because I knew there were people watching me. I knew there were young people they wanted to see if I was going to be at services on a Sunday night or on a Wednesday night. I knew that people knew when I weren't there because they liked to come up and talk to me. They, I don't know, back in the day, I guess I was younger, and they felt like, uh, you know, we had some camaraderie. So they'd come and talk to me. 
And I knew that I needed to be there. I needed to set the right example. And I needed to be an example for them. Because people look towards you. People look at you. They want to know how you live in your life. People look to other people to see how they ought to be. It's, it's human nature. We ape one another. We copy each other. Philippians 2.20, we see that Timothy was exactly what Paul, he was that kind of example. Paul will tell the Philippian brethren, I, I have no man like-minded. That's what he thought of Timothy. Timothy was the right kind of example. In 3 John verses 1, we find a great example. Gaius, John says, whom I love in the truth. He says in verse 3, I rejoice greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee. Gaius was a great example, but John also gives us a bad example. In verse 9, he'll say, I wrote into the church, but Diotrephes, who loved to have the preeminence among them, received us not. He'll drop down in verse 11 and say, but that which is good, you know, beloved, follow not that which is evil, but follow after that which is good. Here's an example of what's good. Gaius is a good fella. Don't be like the bad uh, uh, Diotrephes. Then he'll give us another good example of Demetrius. He said, Demetrius hath good report of all men. So we see both kind of examples in the New Testament as well. But we gain examples. One of the best ways we grow is to follow the examples of godly brethren. I know as a young person, I, I still lead singing a lot like the men that I grew up listening to and their mannerisms and the way they conducted themselves. As a matter of fact, I wanted to learn how to lead singing because of the men that were leading singing. They meant something to me. They were authority figures, if you will. And I love those men. And I appreciate how sometimes they would try to do things that they weren't, they could, they didn't know the song. And some of them weren't that good of song leaders. But I'll tell you what, they got up and did it. You know why? Because it needed doing. And so they got up and they did it. And I thought to myself, you know, one day I may have to get up and do that. I need to learn how to do that. And so they were examples to me. And I'll tell you something else, they were encouragements to me. They'd come up and tell me what a great job I did when I knew it was way too high and everybody left out there with voices hurting. You know, but they were encouragements to me. One of the best ways to grow is to look at godly brethren and try to imitate them. We imitate what we're around. It's as natural as anything. Brethren, I realize that I haven't said anything in this lesson that's new. Nothing at all. You've known all this. Just reminders. The Apostle Peter talked about how he, written, he wrote both his books simply for the fact to put brethren in remembrance of the things that they already knew. So these are just reminders, but do. Don't ever underestimate the devil. He is strong, and remember, he has weapons too, and he's not going to hit you upside the head with a bat. That ain't how it works. He's going to do things like use deception. He's going to use complacency. You kind of get stuck in a rut, and it don't mean anything to you anymore. You're just kind of going through the motions. That's the type of weapons that he uses. And in using those kind of weapons, it gives us the, well, who does he think he is attitude when we're admonished by brethren. Who does that preacher think he is talking about that? I bet he does that. Who's he to say something about that? Who does he think he is? And sister so-and-so, there she was trying to get me to do this or do that. Who does she think she is? You see, that's the devil working. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. And yet a lot of times somebody puts it in our head. You know who it is. It's him. It's the devil. Puts those thoughts in there. Who do they think they are? That's the, that's the way he works. That's the way the devil works. He will make friendship with the world more appealing than in the church. You know, the brethren talks, excuse me, the Bible talks, brethren, that we are to prefer one another. Yet how many of us, in our free time, spend our free time with brethren? Let that sit for a moment. What does the Bible say? Prefer one another. Why? When I'm with another Christian, I'm going to be far less tempted to do something I shouldn't do, maybe something I have a weakness for, I'm just not going to do it. If I've got our brother or sister there in Christ, I know he's going to rebuke me if I do it. And let's just, you know, we'll pray that that's the case, that you'd get a rebuking. But that's, that's the idea there. The devil, he's going to say, oh, that ain't that big a deal. You go ahead and run with those uh, friends of yours that run out there in the world. Don't worry about it. You're strong. You're a Christian. You'll be okay. You see, that's the kind of weapons that he uses and the philosophies of men. We said something here this morning. I hope to encourage you. I hope to build you up. But if you're here this morning and not a New Testament Christian, then really the things we've been talking about don't really apply to you, nor will they next week when we talk about what we say when we <clears throat> come to the assemblies.
No, basically we've been start talking to brethren this morning about Christians, to Christians. It could be the case that you're here this morning and say, you know, I'd like to be a Christian. I'd like to have that kind of strength when I'm going through trials. I'd like to have that kind of support group. I'd like to be a part of that family. The Bible's pretty clear on how you do that. It's very simple. You simply confess the fact that you believe that Jesus is the Christ. If you don't believe that, me and you need to spend some time together. We'll go through secular history. We'll go through the Bible. I'll prove to you that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Once you believe that, you must confess that before men. You must be willing to say that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Repenting of your sins, that means not living like the world anymore, but doing as God would have you to live your life, following his word. Then be, ba then be baptized for the remission of your sins. The Lord will take care of the rest of it. He'll add you to the church. And then you begin that walk, as we've talked about today, and, and go through those things that we've talked about today, how to encourage in each other and so forth. Perhaps you remember the Lord's church, but you've got your priorities out of line. You realize some of the things we talked about today, you're not gathering or getting a lot of that because, well, maybe you've just been going through the motions. You need to put your life back in order. We stand ready to assist any that has need of prayers of the church, any way that we can help at all. If you have a need, would you come? As together we stand and while we sing.